Okay guys, it's set seven regarding carboxylic acids and esters. We'll do that structure and bonding nomenclature thing. We are going to discuss in particular the acidity of carboxylic acids, being able to interconvert from carboxylic acid to esters, and then talking a little bit about reactions, naming and properties of esters themselves. These were two uh, compounds that we made uh, whenever we talked in the last set about aldehydes and ketones. So let's keep going through all the uh, different functional groups and different kinds of organic molecules. Carboxylic acids. Those are the organic compounds that contain the COOH, C double bond O, that's a double bond one, two, OH. The general structure for a carboxylic acid is shown here with the R group, carbons and whatever else is out on that other side. With the C double bond O, the last carbon, and an OH off of that one as well. This part, without what, uh, uh, even having a comment on what's out here, this is called the carboxyl group. Remember, this is a carbonyl carbon. It's not the same as the carboxyl group that contains all of that. And acetic acid or vinegar is definitely the simplest carboxylic acid. They can be abbreviated as RCOOH or RCO2H whenever we're doing the condensed formulas. Esters, on the other hand, are slightly different because they contain an OR instead of an OH bonded to that carbonyl C double bond O atom. So that's what an ester is. You see the OR, the alkoxy group, bonded directly to the carbonyl carbon. Methyl acetate is a simple example. And esters, instead of being RCOOH or RCO2H, they have Rs. And this R is different than at R. That, that R, that's why that's a prime. That means two different alkyl groups. And, of course, R can be the same, R equal to R prime, or they can be different. That happens if R is not equal to R prime. Simple enough. Okay, so what's something that we need to remember and think about with carboxylic acids and esters? That carbonyl carbon is trigonal planar. There are three places where you can find electrons. The double bond, the single bond, and the single bond. There are no lone pairs, so this is trigonal planar geometry. And shape. Because there's no invisible lone pairs of electrons on the carbon. So it's two-dimensional flat. F-L-A-T. 
Of course, that's a polar bond because oxygen is far more electronegative than the carbon. So we've got a partial positive and a partial negative. The O is more electronegative than the C. So the carbonyl group is polar. And that carbonyl oxygen is electron rich because it likes to grab the electrons and pull them close in the bond where the carbonyl carbon is electron poor or electron deficient. That's why it has the partial positive sign associated with it. And we'll just throw this one last piece in before we keep moving. You can also have cyclic structures and a lactone is a cyclic ester in which the carbonyl carbon gets bonded to that OR ring. It's got some sort of relation in a way, if you want to think about it, to, uh, to those acetals and semi-acetal when they're cyclic. Sort of similar. Not exactly, but similar. All right, so let's do some naming for the carboxylic acids first. IUPAC naming of carboxylic acids is the same that we always go through the business. Find that longest chain that contains the functional group that dominates what the molecule is. Change the E at the end, like propane, if it's a, a three carbon chain, and change it to propanoic acid. And we numbered the chain to put the so. COOH, the carboxylate or carboxyl group at C1, but because it's always C1, because that OH has to be at the very end, we can omit the one. So we're counting this carbon as number one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's four methyl and five methyl. Hexane becomes a hexanoic acid. So then you put them together, 4,5-dimethyl hexanoic acid. As always, not too bad. Same old, same old when it comes to IUPAC naming. All right, a couple of practices here. Practice. Always with the practice. Okay. So remember, that's the C. Maybe this is the best way to remember that if you have some sort of group off the end, that this is not the carbon. Take a look. That carboxyl. Cat's playing with a toy. Um, that carboxyl group is the C double bond O, OH. So that's not a carbon. Good to remember. Okay, so one, two, three, four. So that's a butanoic acid. And carbon one here, two here, three. So that's a three hydroxy butanoic acid. Very nice. One down, one to go here. Looks a little longer, a little bit more involved, but it's really not that bad. That's carbon one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. So it's a heptanoic acid with a three chloro and a four isopropyl. And three chloro, because of the C, comes before the four isopropyl because of the I. So three. Chloro, four, isopropyl, heptanoic acid. 
you can do that. I know you can do that, especially if you practice up and get rid of some of your uh, simple mistakes on your homework. That way, whenever you go to do it on a quiz or on an exam, you'll be right on and already made your mistakes. Practice is always important. Not just watching, but practicing. Okay. There are also common names that are used for carboxylic acids, in which you use that common prefix followed by ic acid. We've seen some of this before. There's form ic acid with a one carbon, acetic acid with a two carbon, three carbons and it's propion, so propion ic acid, and buter for like butane is four carbon butyric acid. Butyric acid is what happens when butter goes rancid. That's what gets formed. In any case, a quick look, IUPAC versus common names, methane, methanoic acid versus formic acid, ethanoic versus acetic, propanoic versus propionic, and butanoic versus butyric. Okay, nice. So let's uh, go and do some more. And in this case, we're going to uh, be careful because there's some special kind of um, nomenclature that we have to use with alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so the carbon adjacent to the carboxyl carbon is called the alpha carbon. Okay, so that's the alpha carbon. The one next to it is the beta carbon. The one next to that is the gamma carbon, if there was a gamma. So if we're looking here, when we count via IUPAC, that first carbon that is part of the carboxyl group is carbon one, and two, three, and four, right? But whenever we're using common names, alpha, I mean, we sort of assume that that's already going on with the carboxylate or carboxylic acid. And so this carbon is the alpha carbon. This is the beta carbon. This is the gamma carbon. So therefore, IUPAC is going to call this 3-methyl four carbon, so butanoic acid. And the common name is butyric acid. But instead of using numbers, we're going to say that the methyl is on the beta carbon. So beta methyl butyric acid. This is the IUPAC name, and that's the common name. They both mean exactly the same molecule. Just different ways of naming it. There are also aromatic carboxylic acids. The ring gets numbered, as always, to give the lowest possible numbers to any constituents after the one goes with the benzoic acid base. So if this is carbon one, that's the third position which means we're going to call this either 3-amino 
benzoic acid. Or you could also call it meta or M amino benzoic acid. All right? Amino benzoic acid. Because it's in the meta position compared to where the benzoic acid forms with that carbon being carbon number one. So what do we got here? This is carbon number one, two, three, four. So that's three, four, dichloro, benzoic acid. Cool beans, moving on. C1 has to be where the benzo, benzoic acid uh, gets defined. All right, so uh, what would you call this? What name would you add on to this guy? It's definitely carboxylic acid. So this is carbon number one, the smallest way to count. And it doesn't matter which way you count, you'll get the same thing which is an ethyl group hanging off of carbon 2, right? So then we'd go through, and that would be 2-ethyl, 4 carbon, so butanoic acid, right? Right? 2-ethyl butanoic acid. Hey, guys, that's the wrong answer. Why? Because that's the IUPAC name. We want to know what the common name is. And the common name is alpha, beta, gamma. And since this is the alpha carbon, we're going to call it alpha ethyl. And we're not going to call it butanoic. We're going to call it butyric acid. And that is C for common. Okay? Got to be careful. Got to read carefully. Okay, IUPAC and common name. So let's go, uh, let's go IUPAC first. This is two carbons, so it's ethane. Only we're going to make it the ethanoic acid. This is a one, two, three carbon. So that's a propanoic acid. That's O, propanoic acid, with a 2-methyl hanging off of it. And that's carbon 1, so that's 2, so that's 2-bromo-benzoic acid. So we did IUPAC first. Now let's go common. Two carbon, simple, that's called acetic acid. Three carbon is propionic. acid. And instead of counting one, two, three, we count alpha, beta. So this is alpha methyl. Propionic acid. And 
You could also, if you wished, call this ortho. Actually, I don't think we use alpha and beta when it comes to uh, a benzene ring. So we're going to call this ortho or O bromo benzoic acid. Okay. There are a bunch of interesting carboxylic acids out there. Simple carboxylic acids, think of vinegar. Have a foul or biting odor. Take a big heart. I'll tell you what. What I've done before is I've uh, I've cooked uh, onions to try to make uh, some um, you know cooked onions to put on my burger or something. And I like uh, balsamic vinegar a lot. So I'll cook down and reduce the onions a little bit with a little bit of. Uh, onion or something like that and, and butter and whenever they start to get uh, a little bit translucent a little bit sweeter start to uh, caramelize the onion a little bit I'll throw some balsamic vinegar in and if it gets to boiling if it's pretty good and hot and some of the vapor hits my nose oh my gosh that cleans out the sinuses all the way back to the very back of your head um, very an astringent smell to it. So vinegar have uh, biting odors. There are several skincare products to smooth out those pesky fine lines that contain alpha hydroxy acids. I think it's even called alpha hydroxy. And how do these things work? Well, you have many layers of skin and the outermost layer, layer is dead. These are dead skin cells that are on the outside that you are constantly shedding and uh, revealing uh, an underneath layer. And what alpha hydroxy acids do is react and remove the outer older layer of skin cells that reveal the healthier looking new cells underneath. That's all they really do. There's also aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. All of these guys are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and they all contain a carboxyl group. Every single one of them. Acetyl salicylic acid is what aspirin is. There's ibuprofen and there's naproxen. Maybe you've heard of it as naproxen sodium. What we'll find out is this H will leave, It'll be a minus charge, and we'll make the sodium salt. But that's in the future. All right, so how do we make carboxylic acids? We want to try to make these things, right? They're prepared by, we've already seen this, oxidizing primary alcohols or aldehydes. We've done it before. How did we do that? Oxidation. Oxidizing. Adding a CO bond. I'll just say add, losing a CH bond, losing an H. So you're going to lose the H, add uh, another CO bond, you make the, uh, the aldehyde, and you do it again, you make the carboxylate. So we've got a alcohol.
we're going to react with a mild oxidant. And we're going to make an aldehyde. And if we keep going, we'll make the carboxylic acid. This is already an aldehyde, right? So all we can do is turn this into carboxylic acid. All the rest of it is shrubbery. All of this out here stays exactly the same. And all we do is focus on the reaction at the particular site of the particular functional group that undergoes this oxidation. That's part of your job. It looks really complicated, crazy complicated, but really all the, the business end of this is just we add one little OH onto here. Okay, good job. So what do we want to say about the properties of carboxylic acids, well, they are strongly polar molecules. What else do we know? They have two polar groups, right? The hydroxyl is a partial negative, partial positive, and the carbonyl carbon, which is partial positive partial negative. There they are. So there's two polar groups on that thing, highly polar. And they can also form what's known as a dimer. And a dimer basically takes two carboxylic acids, sort of flips them over, and they don't bond but they do make two strong intermolecular force hydrogen bonds that sort of holds those two ethanoic acid molecules together. And because they're acids and they're very polar, they form IMF H bonds. with many, many water molecules. There they are, water molecule, water molecule, water, water, and water, all of them hanging off of either lone pairs matching up with the hydrogen, doing that over here, and we've got the lone pairs on the oxygen, lining up, making the hydrogen bond with the uh, hydrogen off the OH of the carboxylic acid. And anytime you're making lots and lots of hydrogen bonds, you know what that means. That means we can talk about boiling points and melting points. And they're even higher than the alcohols because there's more spots than just uh, an alcohol where you can make hydrogen bonds. There's a partial negative here, and a partial negative here, and a partial positive here. So that's three IMF H bond spots, for lack of a better word places where it can form. How many is on this? There's one, two, three. So two, three, four, five. 
five IMF H bonding spots. And therefore, more hydrogen bonding means more places to hang on to each other and hang on to water molecules, which makes the boiling point higher. Look at that, um, uh, 21 degrees higher. Okay, makes sense, right? Boiling point increases when we get to the carboxylic acid compared to similarly sized alcohols. Carboxylic acids also have higher boiling points. And melting points. Then esters, because esters can't make hydrogen bonding, right? Because there's no OH in an ester. Therefore, no IMF H bonding between esters. There can be with water, but that just has to do with solubility. And look at that huge difference. Huge difference in boiling point because of all that hydrogen bonding that's possible. Much harder to get the propanoic acid into the gas phase. Much stronger intermolecular forces. And once again, it's a similar trend that we've seen in the past. Boiling points increase as the size of the molecule increases just because of the dispersion forces. But look at that solubility. Even the big guys are slightly soluble simply because they've got all those chances for hydrogen bonding. Okay, now let's talk about the acidity level carboxylic acids. You remember from um, Chem 111, we, you remember, right, um, the idea of strong acids and weak acids. You remember the strong acids, HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, HClO3, HClO4, and H2SO4, and all the rest of the acids are weak. So carboxylic acids are weak acids, but they're still proton H plus donors. And that's what acids do. They give away H pluses when they react. Here's a typical carboxylic acid. The H leaves, goes onto the water to make the carboxylate minus one anion and the hydronium ion which is plus one which is really acid okay and they are weak acids compared to those inorganic, non-organic acids like HCl or H2SO4 or all those other strong acids that I think you had to memorize. Didn't you have to memorize seven strong acids? I know students in 110 and in 115 have to. Maybe 111 don't. But the key here is that an organic acid is going to be a weak acid. And by weak acid, that means only a small percentage. It's actually tiny percentage of a carboxylic acid actually loses its H to become the carboxylate anion. 
and look, uh, well, we'll keep going, maybe talk about reactions in just a second. Like right now, reactions with bases. Carboxylic acids react with a base like sodium hydroxide to form a water soluble ionic compound. Water soluble is key. And when we talk about an ionic compound, the general ner uh, name for that is a salt. Now, when I say salt, you think sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle on my fries. But when a chemist hears salt, he thinks ionic compound. And the general reaction is acid plus base makes salt plus water. Always remember that. Because no matter what it is, if it's an acid and it reacts with the base, it's going to make an ionic compound and water. So acetic acid reacts with the base. What happens? The H plus gets transferred. They switch partners. You make water and you make the sodium salt. The carboxylic acid donates the proton to the base, the hydroxide, which it accepts it to form HOH, single bond, or H2O, water. So that's the water part. And then there's the salt part. Okay, carboxylate anions, the salts of carboxylic acids. This is actually a pretty important deal. The salts of carboxylic acids are water-soluble ionic solids. Okay, so the salts of carboxylic acids, whenever you react it with a base, the acid with the base, you make a water-soluble ionic compound. Really important because it could take a water-insoluble large carboxylic acid and by reacting it with a base, we can turn it into a water-soluble carboxylic acid salt. And in that way, we can get something that normally wouldn't be able to be dissolved in water and then dissolve it in water. Why is that important? Drug delivery. Get something into the bloodstream quicker. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Here's an example. Octanoic acid, eight carbons. That's huge. It's very inorganic mostly nonpolar, so it's water insoluble. But if you react this stuff with the base, remember the H leaves with the OH to make water, and what you end up with is the sodium salt or sodium octanoate, and this stuff is water soluble. It dissolves in water because everything that's a sodium salt dissolves in water. In this way, if you poured octanoic acid into a glass of water, it would either float on top or sink to the bottom. But if you reacted the stuff with sodium hydroxide, you'd make a crystalline solid that you could then throw into water and it would dissolve. Soap. Soap has been used by humankind for over 2,000 years. They are the salts of carboxylic acids. 
that have many carbon atoms in a very long hydrocarbon chain. But then they have a carboxylate salt at the end. Okay, so a soap mole molecule has basically two parts to it. This part is polar, right? Definitely polar with the charge and everything. So it has a polar head, which is the ionic part. And then a non-polar tail. And since it's polar, it's hydrophilic because it likes water. And the ionic end is hydrophilic, but the nonpolar tail does not like water. We call it hydrophobic. Okay, so you got a hydrophobic part and a hydrophilic part to a soap molecule. And if you want to know about soap, Fight Club, my friends, watch the movie Fight Club. What's the first rule of Fight Club? You're supposed to know that. Anyway, how does soap clean away dirt? Okay, there's the polar head and the nonpolar tail. It's hydrophobic, doesn't like water. Hydrophilic part likes water. So what is dirt? Well, dirt includes oils. Have you seen this stuff? Women who are listening, have you seen this stuff in the stores? It's special. It's called micellar water. Are you using it? Do you think it's something special that's really, really new and improved and great? Dudes, it's just soap. Micellar water is just soapy water. Can you see what we got here? Water molecules. There's the the polar head that are attracted to the water and then the nonpolar tails that are attracted to the oil and grease. So the, the nonpolar sort of dissolves the grease because that's also nonpolar, like dissolves like. And then the waters like to dissolve the polar heads. So there's like dissolves like. And the combination works great. Nonpolar hydrocarbon tails trap the nonpolar grease and oil. And then the polar head remains on the surface sealing off the grease. And then whenever you rinse the water, rinse your clothes, the micelle washes away. And that's how cleaning happens. Sort of pretty cool, sort of. Carboxylic acids can react. And when they do, with alcohols, they form esters. Here's an example. There's a carboxylic acid that reacts with an alcohol. And before we had H and OH, and the OH would pop off And now the OH is popping off again, but OR is getting added in. So you see what's going on here. R 
C double bond O, OR, well that's an ester group. So the OR prime replaces the OH group. There's a name for this, for the guy who sort of invented it. It's the Fisher esterification. It's a famous reaction. Fisher esterification. So an example would be acetic acid reacting with ethanol. The OH pops off, takes the H, forms the water, and what goes on? The alkoxy group attaches directly onto the carbonyl carbon, and you make this ethyl acetate ester and water. Don't forget, you're adding water. Okay. Equilibrium process means that the reaction goes both directions at the same time. Just like your checking account has money coming in whenever you get paid and money going out at the same time to pay for lunch and pay for bills. And so the process goes both ways at all times. So it's an equilibrium system. The forward reaction is happening at the same time and at the same rate as the reverse reaction. And you reach a steady state in which all the reactants and the products are present um, at steady concentrations. So if we wanted to make more of the ester, how might we do that? Well, do you guys remember Le Chatelier's principle? Le Chatelier's principle says, if you make a change or put a pressure on an equilibrium system, the system will adjust or move in order to regain that equilibrium. So that means if you have extra products, increase the concentration of these products, it'll force the reaction to go to the right to make, uh, I'm sorry, reactants. If you add more reactants, you make more products. If you take away products as they're made, you're gonna wanna make more product. So. Water is usually a big part to this because water is easy to remove. You just sort of heat it up. So you can either use excess alcohol or acid, but the alcohol is usually a lot easier to get, a lot less expensive. So you just add extra reactant and it will drive the reaction to the right to get more of the product you want, the ester. Or you can remove the water as soon as it gets formed and that's relatively easy to do as well. So if this keeps disappearing and that's one of the products, it's gonna make the reaction run to the right. Pretty cool. All right, so let's think about this. Man, this is the challenge. You have to identify what this is. Identify what this is. Understand that that is a catalyst. And then you have to be able to predict the products. And you can only do this by looking. And it makes sense now. Why does it make sense now? Because we're looking at these right now. Right? I mean, think about it. We're doing this. We're taking the carboxylic acid.
and we're reacting it with an alcohol, and what are we going to make? An equilibrium with the ester plus water, right? What's the ester? That gets added here, and this and this leave to make the water. So what are you going to make whenever you add CH3CH2O onto that carbonyl carbon? Well, where's the carbonyl carbon? There, 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 or there, right? So what's attached to the carbonyl carbon? That and that, right? Because those are the same. So it's got to be either B or C. And what gets added on? That. So that's B. This is a Fischer esterification. And your job is to recognize it because we're going to have all kinds of different reactions, reactants that could possibly be made mixed all together. That's what a chemist can do. And your job is going to be identify what you have and recognize that when you have a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, you're going to make an ester every time. Okay, challenge. Practice, get good at it, keep working. Okay, so we made an ester. Now let's name the sucker. We named the R prime group connected to the oxygen as an alkyl group. We named the acyl group, the RC double bond O, by changing the ic acid to eight. And that becomes the second part of the name. So we look at this big beast and we say that's the pentyl group, the R prime group connected to the oxygen. Okay. And then we look at this, recognize that it's derived just from a methanoic because it's the acyl group or formic depending on whether you're going common or IUPAC. So we've got a pencil group and the other side of it is methanoic or formic acid. So we're going to call it a methanoate or a form eight. And so if we go with our IUPAC name, it's pentol. Okay, we're naming the R group. Methanoate. Or pentol. Formate. Okay. That's it. It's a little bit sort of hard to wrap your head around compared to the other ways that we've named other things, but all you got to do is practice it up and you'll get good at it. Let's do a couple of practices. Sorry about that. We're always going to uh, do the IUPAC name first, followed by the, uh, the common name. All right, I think you got that first one. So let's uh, do number two. That's a one, two, three carbon. So that's a propyl group. That comes first. We've got a one, two, three, four carbon. So that's a butanoate part. Right? 
And then we've got some substituents off of there. That's a 2-chloro, 3-methyl. Chloro comes before. So we start with the propyl. That's letting everybody know after we finished with the butanoate, that's the propyl attached to the four carbon butanoate part. And now we're going to substitute off the butanoate, which says 2 chloro. 3-methyl butanoate. Got it? All right, let's try again. Ethyl. And then 1, 2, 3, so that's either propanoate. If I know eight. Yeah, we'll just go with that. We'll just call it ethyl. Propanoate, that lets you know that it's an ester. That's how you pack. In the common, is ethyl again, but it's propionate. Propionate. Ethyl propionate. All right, one last one. Propyl group off the alkoxy part. And then this is two carbon, which makes it an ethanoate. or uh, acetate. All right, so we've either got propyl ethanoate or propyl acetate. All right, so we went from structure to name. Now let's go from name to structure. It's important that you remember that O8 means ester. This is the alkoxy part. Okay, the OR part. So when I see ethyl, I like going like this. That's the ethyl part, okay? And then pentanoate means five carbons. There's carbon one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's a nice way to sort of, that's carbon one. Okay, so that's sort of a way to think about it, and maybe it helps you actually put uh, esters together whenever you're sort of taking them apart to name them. So propyl ends up on the other side of the carbonyl carbon, O, and propyl is three carbons. So that's CH2, CH2, CH3, and then butyrate is four carbons. So there's carbon one, two, three, four. Just don't mix them up. Excellent. Okay, so there's a big long line formula. Let's 
IUPAC name this thing? You know what comes first? One, two, three. Three carbons is propyl. We already know what the name is because the propyl comes first. Let's make sure it's right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a heptanoate. So propyl heptanoate. Bingo, beauty. Okay, moving on. The lower molecular weight esters have wonderfully, wonderfully pleasant odors. It's nice to have one that smells not like skunks or nasty astringent stuff in your nose, but smells good. Ethyl butanoate is the mango smell. Pentylbutanoate comes from apricots, and methyl salicylate is oil of wintergreen. Go into a bed, bath, and body works, and I guarantee you, ethyl butanoate and pentyl butanoate will be everywhere because they take these chemicals, they don't take mangoes and squish them into a hand cream. No, they'll get ethyl butanoate. They can make it. They don't have to squeeze a bunch of mangoes. You can make ethyl butanoate in the lab, right? From butyric acid and ethyl alcohol. We already did it, a Fischer esterification. So there you go, right? So that stuff is gonna be all over the place in there and you can um, enjoy that smell. As long as it's not something dangerous, you stick it in and it smells great. That's how that goes, okay? Excellent. Aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, okay? is a pain and inflammation um, reducer. It is an ester of salicylic acid and acetic acid. You react the two, a fissure esterification, and you get it from the bark of a willow tree. And what's sort of cool about this stuff, I don't know, uh, sometime go to your grandma's house or something like that, or if you have a bottle of aspirin that hopefully you haven't had to use very much in your life and it's relatively old, if you open it up, maybe even a relatively new one, if you open it up, you know what it smells like? It smells like vinegar because this is one of the degradation products of acetyl salicylic when it salicylic acid when it gets old breaks down vinegar gets produced you don't make anything dangerous just isn't as doesn't have the analgesic qualities that aspirin does or the anti-inflammatory but you can definitely smell the acetic acid coming off of it okay so pairs Propyl ethanoate, pentyl ethanoate is bananas, octyl ethanoate, oranges. I'm pretty sure that they use things like this uh, to fragrance mixed drinks as well. All of these compounds are in the flowers and fruits, so they're clearly not dangerous, at least in small quantities. Okay. All right, now let's talk a little bit about uh, boiling points. Boiling points of esters. Remember, R, C, double bond, O, O, R, are definitely going to be higher than alkanes. Why? It's polar. 
And so if it's polar, it's going to have dipole forces. Dipole, dipole. Even though it has no H bonding. Notice that as soon as I think boiling points, I think structure, then I think shape, then I think polarity, then I think IMFs. Because that's how you have to think about it. In that order. I don't want you to memorize this is bigger than that or smaller than that. No, I want you to know and recognize what the molecules are. And then I want you to go through the logical process of understanding which have higher intermolecular forces, stronger or weaker, because then it's obvious and easy and explainable. Oh, I like it whenever you can explain it to somebody else. That way you really understand it. You really know it then. And I think that should be the goal of everybody to really know this stuff, right? Now the boiling points are higher than alkanes, but they're lower than alcohols and carboxylic acids, right? You would definitely know that because hydrogen bonding occurs in alcohols and carboxylic acids, but definitely not in esters. And there it is. Look at this. The molar masses are very close for these four compounds, off by just a little bit. If it's an alkane, it boils at freezing temperatures. 32 degrees is a pretty darn warm day. That's how high you have to boil. Uh, the temperature has to be up that high in order to get this ester to go into the uh, vapor phase. But you got to get way hotter and even way hotter for the alcohol or the carboxylic acid to go into the vapor phase. You're not surprised by this. Esters will be soluble in water if they're relatively small. Two to five carbon atoms. They can form intermolecular force hydrogen bonds between a partially negative carbonyl oxygen And a partial positive with the water. That's the hydrogen bond that goes on. For the esters. And the solubility in water decreases rapidly with increasing number of carbon atoms. So once you get past five there's no way that it's going to be soluble in water. And finally, an ester will react with water in the opposite direction to form a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. This is a hydrolysis reaction. And lysis means cut. Hydro, you can think of this as water. So what do you do with the hydrolysis? You cut out a water. That's what it looks like, ester hydrolysis, using an acid catalyst. Okay, we start with the ester. That's going to leave, and that's going to come in, and the H is going to pop on to the end, 
to make the alcohol. And the carboxylic acid. It's the opposite reaction of esterification, that's all. And this time, if we want to make the carboxylic acid and the alcohol, all we have to do is add water, which is cheap. Add a reactant, and it pushes the reaction to the product. So esterification and hydrolysis are reverse reactions. So if you have that set up, an equilibrium set up, and you want the, uh, the alcohol or the carboxylic acid, you would drive it to the left by adding extra water. If you want the ester, you would remove the water or add extra acid or extra um, alcohol. So you can run that reaction going back and forth because esterification is in one direction and hydrolysis is in the other. And ester hydrolysis can also be done by using an aqueous base And that's called a saponification. There's your ester, water, catalyzed and reacted with the sodium hydroxide in the water. So what's going to happen? This is going to leave. That's going to attach to there. O is going to come here, but it's going to be an O minus and the Na plus. So you make the carboxylate anion and the alcohol. The basic hydrolysis forms the carboxylate anion rather than the carboxylic acid product. Soap making, or saponification, again, we're talking Fight Club. Please, if you have not ever watched Fight Club, you need to watch it. It's amazing. Soap making is in there. Okay. Soap making is the base hydrolysis of long chain fatty acids or esters that produce acid salts, and acid salts are called soaps. So there's a fatty ester base, metal plus, like Na plus OH minus. Heat and water, you make glycerol, and you make the carboxylic acid salts, minus charged. Okay, one quick hydrolysis of esters and then we're done with this set. Methyl acetate reacts with water and an acid catalyst. Methyl acetate reacts with water and KOH. So what's methyl acetate? So you got to get that right. Okay, the methyl part is that side. Acetate is that. So that's what methyl acetate is. So we're going to take this stuff 
We're going to react it with water and an acid catalyst like H2SO4. What are we going to make? We're going to take that off. We're going to make the carboxylic acid. In this acid solution and we're also going to make methyl alcohol right the OH from the water attaches to the carbonyl carbon and the H that's left over attaches to that alkoxy oxygen to make the alcohol okay so if it's in the presence of acid you're going to make the carboxylic acid what if the same stuff is in the presence of water And KOH. This is the base part and whenever you have the base part you're not going to make the acid you're going to make the salt. So what do you make? The CH3 C double bond O O minus K plus plus the alcohol. Carboxylate anion. Okay. That concludes this set. So Get to studying, get to doing the homework, get to practicing this stuff so you can get good at it. Remember to challenge yourself to identify what's there and then identify the kind of reactions that are going to occur. Good luck. Rooting for you.